Hi, welcome to the Leasing Better playbook for lease renewals. We're going to talk a little bit about how you plan for a lease renewal if you expect to get a fair and competitive rental rate and terms on your renewal. You're going to need to start early. You need to have a process. Your landlord's a professional. They probably also have hired an expensive real estate company uh, to help them lease the space out. They have a $500 an hour commercial real estate attorney. This is serious business. Even if you have what is considered a small lease for a short three year term, uh, you're with near certainty making a six figure business obligation. If you have 50 plus employees in an office or a 40,000 square foot or larger warehouse, you're more likely to make a seven figure obligation and perhaps larger. You'd better take it as seriously as if your company was involved in a lawsuit of that size. The landlord's asset manager gets his or her bonus based on how much they increase the revenue on your property. The highly paid professionals on their side of the table have to justify those fees. They all work on several, probably hundred leases each year. They're smart professionals. Don't expect to do this once every three, five or seven, 10 years and outwit them. Your only chance for success is to create market competition. Accept that you're not a better negotiator than them, but that the market is a better negotiator. If you can get other landlords to competitively bid for the future income stream offered by your firm, that market force will apply downward pressure on your rent and improve the other terms. You need a process. We want to share with you what we've learned from working with some of the world's largest law firms. You can check out a list on our website and companies such as Sprint, UPS, McKesson, Spalding Sports, Melita Coffee, Alpha Logistics, and hundreds of other clients. This is not a sales infomercial. We're glad to freely share our processes with you. Um, and we've learned a lot of lessons and hope that you will reciprocate and share them with us. We're always trying to learn more and improve. If you follow this plan, you too can maximize your negotiating leverage, evaluate all of your options, be able to understand the ever elusive definition of market rate and make the absolute best decision for your firm. This process will work well for any company that leases what we call institutional grade class A or B office or warehouse space, generally owned by institutional investors such as REITs, real estate investment funds, or large insurance or pension fund investors. It may not work as well without some tweaking or customization for retail users and anyone who is leasing below institutional grade, you know, what we call mom and pop property. There are just some different rules for retail and smaller spaces, which rely on other dynamics, such as demographics, uh, traffic counts. That's, that's also the same for the mom and pop owners. Most of the processes apply, but there are some that don't because small family owners don't necessarily operate with the uh, unemotional financial discipline that a REIT would do. We're addressing this situation with the assumption that you have already decided that you don't need professional representation, or at least you have not made a final decision yet. Your first and most likely choice is a simple lease renewal. There's nothing too complex about it, nothing happening such as an expansion, downsizing, or major re reconfiguration. The nine stages of a renewal. There are generally nine common stages of a simple lease renewal. Stage one is strategic planning. Stage two is assessing your baseline. Stage three, understanding the market. Four, assessing the landlord's competition. Five is the shortlist in RFP. Stage six is a proposal for your existing space. 
seven tenant improvements in construction management, if there is any. Stage eight are the actual negotiations themselves. And the final stage is a post-lease follow-up. The strategy for planning a renewal, uh, before diving into the strategic planning uh, part of it, take a moment and assess where you stand. Look at the big picture. If you're planning to renew, here's the likely situation. Your existing space is not perfect, but it works for you just fine. And you or your boss decided it would cost us a fortune to move. And lacking any other compelling reason, you've maybe already decided to renew. You've not received a proposal from your landlord, but assuming they are reasonable, uh, renewal is a foregone conclusion. Well, regarding that thought above, it would cost us a fortune to move, a few points I'd like to make. Number one, it costs a lot less than you think. For an office, the physical move is approximately only 50 cents a square foot, plus maybe $400 a seat for cabling, plus furniture assembly costs if you have cubicles, and minor IT and phone work programming. It's really not expensive nowadays. We've moved up to 850 employees at a single time and many 100,000 plus square foot warehouses in a single weekend, had them shut down on a Friday afternoon and up and operational on Monday morning. It can be done even if you've personally never done it. A uh, new landlord will, in almost every market in North America, provide a move allowance or free rent that will more than cover that cost. Is it expensive and a hassle to move? Well, yes, it is expensive and a hassle to move. But remember, however much it will cost you, it will almost certainly cost your landlord a lot more. Vacancy, marketing, completely rebuilding the space for a new tenant, lost rents while the space is under construction, free rent such as concession to the new tenant to entice their move equals a very, very big number for your landlord. So you're doing your landlord a bit, very big favor by staying. In fact, between 75 and 80% of all tenants renew their leases. So before the landlord even has a conversation with you, they know that the odds are that you're going to renew. You know, imagine going to Las Vegas and knowing that you'll win four out of every five hands of blackjack. The proper lease renewal mindset, when, when you think about a renewal proposal, imagine that you're a tenant walking in off the street. In that case, the landlord is making a proposal to a company considering perhaps five possible locations. This would make their odds only 20% rather than the 80% they can expect from a tenant already in place. Always consider this at renewal time. A commercial building is not worth its replacement cost without a tenant. When they sell, the building is valued on the income stream. And here's a small but very important consideration. You control the income stream. Your business is the income stream. Don't forget that. You've got a lot more power than you probably realize. I know that it seems like the landlord is big and powerful, and certainly that's a very nice big building that they own, but you can bet that the bank will come and take it away from them if they don't have good, you know, full building full of tenants, just like you who pay that mortgage for them with those income streams. A building is generally a commodity. You don't have to advertise to find people who will accept your cash rent money, but they have to advertise their space for rent. Think about that. Within reason, you call the shots. And within reason means that you offer commercially reasonable market terms, taking into consideration the cost of vacancy, marketing, completely rebuilding the space for a new tenant, the lost rents while the space is under construction, and that free rent that they're going to be giving as a concession for any new tenant that takes the space. All of that, the landlord will be forced to pay if they were to lose you as a tenant. Remember that you're dealing with professionals when you deal with your landlord, the landlord's asset managers, 
brokers, and attorneys are all professionals that pay to win. Without a defined strategy, you have as much likelihood of walking away with a good lease deal as you would going to Las Vegas to play in the World Championship of Poker and walking away with all the chips. To do it right, you'll have to go through a process. It might seem like a lot of work if you want to simply renew your lease. And if you don't mind overpaying, just ask for a renewal proposal from your landlord without doing your homework. But if you want to make sure that you're getting the best possible market terms, you've got to prepare with serious intent. There are no shortcuts and this is not a bluff. You have to be fully ready, willing, and able to move if moving is the best and smartest option for your business. There is at least an 80% probability that it's not, but you won't know that for certain until you do this full exercise. Let's talk about holding over. Some clients ask us, can I hold over? Sure, you can do it. You know, you'll probably be a tenant in sufferance that can be evicted in 30 or 60 days, depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, you might have to pay a penalty, double rent by statute in many places, and you could be liable for damages the landlord might incur, such as losing out on a 10 year user that might have signed the lease if you vacated per your original lease contract. So, you can hold over and you can also jump from a plane without a parachute, but neither is really advisable. Let's talk about renewal timeline planning. You need a timeline that will dictate your actions and that gives you the maximum negotiating leverage. The exact timing will depend on your business requirements and alternatives in the market. For this example, let's presume that there is not much complexity in your situation, uh, no special facilities required, there's a large supply of alternate spaces for you to move into. In this case, there are usually three activity periods with some overlap. The first one starts when you uh, would begin to plan a, to build a building. So a build a suit needs to include enough time to buy the land, get approvals, do design, get permits, construct the building. Depending on your market and the size of your company, this usually ranges from 18 to 30 months, with about two years being a comfortable start for most. The next is the range when you would purchase a building. You'll need time for due diligence, closing, and probably some construction to fit the space to your needs, but less time than you'd need for new construction. So this often ranges from nine months to two years. The final range is for leasing in a competitive building. If you're very small and can take a space relatively as is, excepting perhaps carpet and paint, you might make it in four or five months, but most businesses should really be looking seriously at least nine months out. And considering all the options uh, for some companies, 18 months out is very reasonable. So you might say, we wanna wait and see before we get started. Well, you can hold off on getting started with your approaching lease expiration because of a few uncertainties, such as we might land a big contract, we might do that acquisition, we might lose our biggest customer. Right, you know, we get it. You have what is known as a business. By nature, it's full of uncertainty. And while any of those might be reasons to avoid actually inking the new obligation today, None of them are really valid reasons to avoid starting and intelligently positioning yourself for the most likely of those outcomes. Get moving. Some people tell us we don't need that much time and we frequently hear the corporate tenants say, you know, we can do it in three months or six months. You're right if you can move into a mom and pop owned building next to the gas station. If you expect to be in an institutionally owned class A or B building, it will take longer. A uh, simple question that you'd expect to resolve with a quick phone call might take two weeks just to get an answer. It will take a month to negotiate the 50 page lease with the REITs attorney. Six months is a very fast track 
and you will probably compromise on the fine points. Plan to start early and now add three months to that if you want to further improve your position. Let's talk about landlords. You know, in defense of landlords and landlord reps, they are not inherently bad people any more than any other industry or job position. They're mostly good, honest, ethical guys and gals. But by nature to do well in their jobs, they are usually formidable competitors. And it is their job to increase the property income, not to lower it. In the same way that Roger Federer makes his opponent look foolish on the tennis court, and then probably they laugh about it and buy him, he buys him a beer in the bar after. I'm not necessarily sure that the opponent is laughing much, but that's beside the point. These landlord agents will negotiate with you hard and still send you a jar of cashews at the holiday time. So lease renewal time is a very good opportunity to take a close look at your operating expense clause and understand what is and is not an allowable expense. We recently did an operating expense audit for a Fortune 500 bank located in the nicest Class A office building in a city. And one of the charges was for tenant amenities. When we acquired as to the specificity of the amenities, they responded that it was for fruit baskets, jars of nuts, and the like given to tenants as gifts. It made us wonder if the card said, happy holidays from yourself. You didn't think they'd actually deduct the cost from the landlord's net income, did you? How do you get started with real estate strategic planning? First, define your objectives. Perhaps it is simple as let's just renew. Knowing what you want is a great first step. Determine whether you need professional representation and we're presuming no for this video. Plenty of people represent themselves in court or drop their own wills. A Russian guy even removed his own appendix. You can Google that. Uh, if you're comfortable with it and have the time to do it right, go for it. With that done, you're ready to start taking action. Here's what you do. First, build a timeline. Either you will define the timeline or someone else will do it for you. The landlord has several renewal strategies and they usually employ one of two. First is the early renewal. Sometimes they may approach you up to two years or more in advance of your lease expiration. Are you happy here? Do you need any improvements? This has several advantages for them. If you love the space, why would your firm go through the hassle of a relocation? Check. No improvements needed, which significantly lowers incentive to move and increases cost for the landlord. Check. Willing to talk now when there's only one bidder at the auction? It's a trifecta for them. The other strategy is the late renewal. This strategy is often used when the market vacancy is low and here's how it works. The landlord is just radio silent until you're 30 or 60 days from expiration. And then they only casually inquire, are you gonna stay or are you moving? Of course, they know that design, permitting, construction and mobilizing a move takes six to 12 months for most firms and longer if there's any complexity. Uh, or new construction is required. So your options will be to accept their terms or get out. Since you can't do the latter and not disrupt your business, you'll end up doing the first and they'll act as if they could care less either way. How do you assess your baseline? The first question to ask is how much space do we really need? If you've been in your current space for five years or more, it is probably not very efficient unless your business has not seen much change. Most of us have. Most companies are becoming less paper intensive, so they're reducing the area needed to spread out and store files. We're becoming more collaborative, so requiring more open areas and less large private offices. 
we're reducing administrative help. So this means less rooms needed for secretaries, receptionists, paralegals, and the like. Warehouse users likewise are becoming more efficient at maximizing the queue. So they need more clear height and they're reducing the aisle width to, by moving the narrow aisle picking equipment. In general, all of us are starting to use space more efficiently, thanks mostly to technology. This may make your existing space have what is technically known as functional obsolescence. That's not bad, um, but you should figure that out and determine your current space program, meaning how much space you really need if starting from scratch today and of what type. The renewal process, is it worth it? At some point you might say to yourself, do I really need a process if I'm just renewing? Well, there are three reasons that yes, you need a process. First, you should at the very least be aware of your real requirements and what they would be if you were starting with a blank slate. Next, if the space is inefficient, this actually becomes a negotiating point to your advantage that will keep your landlord from acting overconfident. And finally, since most firms have been able to reduce the square foot per person or the square foot per pallet position that they use, the alternatives that you compare to your current space can be more efficient with a reduced footprint. This allows them to compete not just on a price per square foot, but also on the reduced size. How do you determine your efficient space? Well, there are a number of various online space calculators that can help you do this. You can create your own in a spreadsheet, or you can download our free Leasing Better iPhone or Android app and use the Space Planner feature. Financial analysis of your baseline expenses. To evaluate your existing lease at renewal time, you need to create a spreadsheet showing the pricing information for your current lease. If you have more than a year remaining, and you should if you're starting early, be sure to list the rent amounts for each year. Rent per square foot is mildly interesting, but you really need to understand the monthly cost all in. If operating expenses or electric are charged separately, be sure to add them in. Divide the total rent and expenses due over the term by the number of months to see the fully loaded average monthly rent amount. This is what you need to compare to all of your options. Understanding the market is important, and here's the process. Scan and select target listings online. LoopNet's a good place to start, and there may be some other local listing sites, but avoid the get instant results for your office search sites that ask questions up front and finish with you having to give all of your contact information. These typically are simply lead generation sites for brokers, and they won't produce a report for you without a lead buying broker attached to it. Ideally, you'll get a list of 15 or 20 good candidate properties, and you'll need that many because some will not fit, some will be leased or in final negotiations already, and some will have unattractive terms or the landlord will be unwilling to build them out for you. Contact the agents for the listings you selected, and when you speak with a broker, confirm the availability, the price, future year escalations, operating expenses, offer to build out allowance, and the existing condition of the space. Is it first generation, what we call a raw space, bare concrete, or is it second generation, which means it was previously occupied, may just need carpet paint and moving a few walls around. Confirm the square foot of each suite available and find out what's included in that rate. Some landlords quote all inclusive, some exclude certain operating expenses, which are charged on top of the rents. So be sure to ask specifically, in addition to the rent, what other costs will we be expected to pay? This information is often not volunteered and you may get a, I'll have to check and get back with you on that. When would you like to come by and see it response? So be insistent. 
How do you compare various spaces for lease? Well, you compare your rents on an apples to apples basis by making a baseline cost sheet and using the information as you gather to modify it so that you will have a column for each alternate space that will multiply the asking square foot uh, of each space by the rate for the year of the proposed term. Remember, we're looking at averages. So if you have a year less on your existing lease, the average is what you are paying today, while these other options display averages that are effectively the middle of the longer term lease. If it's a five year lease, it's what you're paying two and a half years into it. So at this point, there are no construction costs also, also referred to as TI or tenant improvements, but you will have to factor that in eventually. Market intelligence. You can get an overview of market rates for your metro area by using the market intel feature of the Leasing Better iPhone or Android app. You can use it to request a no obligation full market overview from a professional real estate advisor. However, while that might tell you some approximate numbers to expect, to really know the true rate of your particular requirements and to position yourself for maximum negotiating leverage, you should do a very detailed search and analysis. You need to assess the competition. And I don't mean your competition, I mean the existing landlord's competition. Calling some listings for rent should give you a good overview of the market, right? Well, no, not really. You still need to put some eyeballs on the physical property and assess the building's location, the quality of construction, the views, the location of the space within the building, a space down the hall on the fifth floor overlooking the parking garage or mechanical equipment, uh, it's not so highly valued as the same with a double door entry off the elevator on the 30th floor overlooking the river. So you need to understand that and probably need to visit it to see that. Uh, you personally don't have to go, but someone that you should trust should visit and assess the property. And while there, do an estimate to understand what improvements would need to be done to make the property suitable for your use. You'll need to value the existing improvements toward your own construction. Will this be a simple carpet paint and move in, or do you need to gut and rebuild it? This can make a very big difference in the end cost, especially if the landlord expects you to fund it at all. Uh, ultimately, you need to do a construction budget, but at the beginning and for now, it can be a very loose back of the envelope number, uh, but you should know the difference between a $100,000 build out and a million dollar build. So who is touring spaces for you? For an actual space tour, while you might be inclined to send your assistant or the office manager, we'd suggest that you send somebody with more authority or go yourself. And here's why. It's a very small community that you're in, wherever you may be. It does not matter if you're in Walla Walla or, down, or New York City Midtown. Every landlord and every landlord rep knows every other one. Yes, some are sworn enemies, but many more are friendly competitors, and they will be especially friendly when they sense that their chance of landing you as a tenant are slim to none, and that they are just being considered to create leverage with your existing landlord. They hate it when that happens to them. So if you send the assistant janitor to take photos of the space, word will get back to your landlord that you're not really serious about relocating. Let's talk about the shortlist and RFP process. Uh, first, you'll determine three to five alternate properties that are actually feasible. They don't need to be uh, comparable to your existing space, and the selection group is typically not about price, but each one should offer some advantages over the existing space that would make a relocation into them attractive, especially if the pricing were favorable. Now, we're going to create a request for proposal or RFP for each prospective landlord. If you have one in your lease file, you might start with it as a guideline. If not, start by taking out your existing lease document and summarize the key points into a two to four page outline 
of the most important items. Consider the description of the premises, the term, rental rate, uh, included operating expenses and utilities, concession, uh, improvement and design allowances, flexibility and renewal rights, maybe termination agreement, parking, uh, HVAC and after hours use, signage, security, exclusivity, and of course, add any special items particular to your business. If you would be taking the space in shell condition, specify the minimum finish conditions before your construction responsibilities kick in. Be specific. Don't assume that the landlord will do any work at all to the space unless you define it in writing. Finally, run it by your legal counsel. Why now? This may be your one opportunity to negotiate the terms without the landlord's legal counsel weighing in. And while a proposal is typically not binding, uh, if you accept and sign it, it's generally considered to be bad faith to renegotiate the terms otherwise agreed upon. It doesn't guarantee that you will get them accepted, but it will never be easier in the negotiation process to get concessions now before you're in deep. Send the RFP to the agents of your top three to five properties and give them a deadline of about a week to respond. For an existing space renewal, you need to send your landlord a request for proposal uh, or RFP. At this point, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, this is supposed to be a renewal process. Is a formal RFP really necessary? And the answer is, no, it's not if you don't mind overpaying. But otherwise, yes, it's absolutely necessary if you want to be in the optimum negotiating position. Remember, this is not a bluff. You have to have options, real options that you would actually relocate to. If you could get a space that is more efficient than you have now with nicer finishes in a brand new building, in a better location, with all the expenses included, ample parking, free car washes, 24 hour a day HVAC on the top floor overlooking your city with your company name on top of the building uh, and the new landlord paying all your moving costs for half the current rent. Well, you get my point. It will probably not be quite that good, but you better develop the mindset that if you find a better option, you are open to relocating. The number one thing not to do when you want a renewal proposal is just send an email to your landlord agent or even worse, pass him or her in the lobby and say, can you send us a renewal proposal? You might as well just give them your check writing privileges on your bank account. Uh, tell them to take out whatever they want. Presumably you have the RFP form that you've created and sent to alternate spaces now modify it for your existing space. Even if the space is in pretty good shape and you don't really want or need any major configuration, I suggest that you ask for some refresh improvement money for a few reasons. First, the space may not look tired now, but if you end up with a five year or longer renewal term, it will be by then. Many landlords also budget in refresh money that is not directly amortized into the rate. That is, the difference between a rate with new carbon paint and an as-is rate may be exactly the same rate. You need to find this out. You can always back off and eliminate these monies later, and it is usually much harder to add it in later if you started without it. The most important part is to set a firm response date with your landlord. You need to control the timing, not your landlord or their agent. After you send the request for proposal, you'll probably get an acknowledgement and respond back to that to confirm that they will meet the deadline. And if they can't, uh, you might get a message like the asset manager will be on her honeymoon from July to September in Zimbabwe without access to email. So, they should tell you that now, not later. Control the renewal timeline. You need to take control of the renewal timeline. Why? 
because your landlord rep has two primary tactics, the early renewal, which they've, if you're close to expiration, they've already missed, and the late renewal, which it's probably too early for them to use to maximum effect if you're starting early as we advise. So it's to their advantage to stall. In addition, they almost certainly know that you have been out scouting other properties, if you really have, because they have had detailed feedback from, especially from the property landlord reps where you walked in and said, this isn't gonna work. Because those reps had nothing to lose to share that information with them and your landlord now owes them a favor back. So the second advantage to stalling you is to gauge your patient's threshold. The longer you are willing to wait for their response, the less intent you probably are on relocating, and they know that. Let's talk about tenant improvements and construction management. For simplicity on your renewal, we're going to presume that your landlord has heard on the street that you've been out looking at alternatives with seriousness and that their existing building and or your current space has enough deficiencies or negatives as to sufficiently convince them that you'd gain some advantages at least by relocating and that you're following a timeline that gives you ample time to affect the move. So while we'll not dive into the stage, you need to be prepared to move into it if your landlord pulls the stall and delays, delays, delays responding to your RFP request. Negotiating a lease. Lease negotiations generally have six parts to their process, so let's dive into them. First is the financial analysis. You start by understanding where you are and where you want to go. Take your existing baseline costs and compare them with all of the proposal responses from the competitive landlords. The column next to your current lease numbers should contain the renewal proposal. Add a row at the bottom that calculates the annual net increase or decrease for each option as compared to your current lease. The one extra item worth mentioning is the construction costs. If every space will be finished to your specifications on a turnkey basis, meaning that the landlord will do all of the work with absolutely no risk or expense to the tenant, which is you, then no adjustment is really necessary here. But if the space needs $250,000 in improvements and the landlord will only provide something less, say $200,000 allowance, you'll need to amortize that $50,000 balance as an upward adjustment to the rent. Be sure to include architect and engineering expenses if you simply have a construction only quote from a contractor. Now the lease terms themselves. Now's the time to actually dig in to further understand the terms beyond just the rental rate. Ask for a copy of the proposed lease document. For your renewal, you wanna confirm this will be a simple amendment to the existing lease and not a completely new document. If the ownership on your building has changed, the landlord might insist on using their own form, which could potentially change many terms from the original lease. Analyze the lease terms using a good commercial tenant lease checklist. You can also get a quick shortlist of terms to improve upon by uploading an existing or proposed lease in the Leasing Better iPhone or Android app using the Make My Lease Better feature. If attorneys often get labeled deal killers, the landlord's broker is generally considered a deal maker. That's because it is in the best interest of their client, the landlord, to lease the space. And it doesn't hurt that his or her motivation that the landlord broker only gets paid uh, if indeed that does happen. Remember, they've probably already completed dozens of leases with this landlord and their attorney. So therefore, they have a very good understanding of what is negotiable and what is not. A good landlord rep can become your ally and help you identify what lease terms 
and items are the most important and where the landlord will have some flexibility. But remember, their fiduciary is to get the best possible terms for the landlord. Never forget that. Letter of intent. An LOI is simply documentation of a term sheet outlining the points that are agreed upon. This may be as simple as redlining the landlord's proposal and making sure that it's a two-party document, so meaning it's signed by both you and them, not just one of you. It probably will and should have language that says it is not binding until a final lease is signed by both parties. The lease document and negotiation and redlining is where you need to dissect the landlord's long lease. If you're renewing and using a simple amendment with all other terms to remain the same, and you're satisfied with your original lease document, there may not be much to negotiate. If it's a new document, you should read the entire lease, highlight the terms that you don't like or may not fully understand, and then forward on to your attorney with questions. We absolutely positively do not recommend making lease comments or modifying language without the advice of a really smart real estate attorney. A typical institutional lease doc is 40 or 50 pages long and not a word is there by mistake. It's all there to protect the landlord and shift as much risk as possible to the tenant. Much of it is negotiable, but that's also dependent on your financial strength, the value of the potential lease, um, you know, when in doubt, object. Some items the landlord expects to give up on easily. Some others they might not remove if your firm was Berkshire Hathaway. The last part of a lease negotiation is signing the final lease document. And this should simply be a formality, but as with any legal document valued in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, you should check it very closely. You'd be surprised how many times we find errors in amounts or bits of accrete upon language that never quite make it into the final signature docs. All good? Well, then sign it and attach your check for the first month's rent and deposit. Even if you received free rent, the lease probably requires you to submit a full month rent and any security deposit upon signing send it off to the landlord. As soon as you get a fully executed copy back, the lease is valid. Congratulations. Okay, the lease is signed. That's it, all done, right? Well, almost, but not quite. There are two primary tasks remaining. First is construction, and that's a whole set of topics that we won't cover now. We'll presume that it's a simple renewal with little or no improvements. Uh, but if they do exist, that will be a big project for you. And your critical dates. Before you file that lease away, be sure to create an abstract of the key points of the lease document so that you and other staff don't need to fish through the entire document. This should be a one or two page summary, they call it an abstract, of the rent schedule, a who is responsible for what explanation, and especially a list of the key dates for notifications or options. Now, key those dates into your calendar and set appropriate alerts. For example, if you have a renewal option that you must give notice by a certain date, I'd suggest that you enter reminders at least 5, 30, 90, and 180 days out, plus one at the one year point. While that might seem excessive, oftentimes the first few alerts get ignored or dismissed. The free Leasing Better Phone app, by the way, has an important dates feature that will allow you to upload a lease. It will make a best effort to auto-identify your critical dates, such as the expiration date, renewal notice date, rent increases, termination options if you have them. You can then view and accept or correct them and or enter your own, and it will give you time-appropriate reminders to stay proactive. Good luck. And please contact us if you have questions or suggestions. Thank you.